Hi, everybody. This is Peter Diamandis, and here with Dan Sullivan for our next episode of Exponential Wisdom. Dan, on this episode, I'd like to do a deep dive into probably one of the most important subjects there is for any entrepreneur, which is hiring great people, at least until AI is able to do all our work for us. Until then, Mm -hmm. humans are fundamental. And my experience is great people can make you, bad people can break you. I'd love, super excited to hear what your thinking is, and I'm excited to share with you my thoughts here. Well, the first thing I learned about that is that there's lots and lots of great people in the world, but they might not be looking for you. Yeah. So as an entrepreneur, you've got to show up as someone who's teaming up with the entrepreneur is a really great idea. There's a great future. It's very exciting. So who you are as an entrepreneur who would be hiring people, you have to show all the qualities up front that you're looking for in other people. Interesting. Yeah, I think ultimately you have to be a stand for your ethos, what you stand for, who you are, the kind of world you want to create. It's a (laughs) simple piece of advice that was given to me once for throwing a great party is if the host is having a great time, everybody at your party will have a great time too. And that's so true. Yeah, and the thing is, I mean, it becomes obvious when you see it, but let's say you have someone who works with you over a long period of time. They've spent more time with you in the entrepreneurial business than anyone else in their life, with the exception of maybe their immediate family on evenings and weekends. So it's a major portion of people's lives, properly structured and properly directed, working as one of the great sources of meaning and pleasure in lifetime. Yeah. Interesting, because work has like a bad connotation. Oh, I got to go work. But we should redefine that to, I need to go contribute, or I need to go have fun, or I need to go and change the world. Mm -hmm. I need to go and be a hero to somebody. Yeah. You know, I didn't think about that before, but work has sort of like, oh boy, got to go and make the donuts, you know, sort of thing. Yeah, but some kids can be really happy you made the donuts. (laughs) So, Dan, let me just start by saying how impressed I have been from the moment that I met you by your team. And then, you know, my Abundance community, Abundance 360, Abundance Digital, all of that came out of our collaboration, just to give, which came from my introduction to you by Joe Polish. And one of the greatest joys of my life has been the team that I've created here, you know, not to list mm-hmm. everybody, but you know, Marissa and Esther and Derek and Connie and Greg and Kelly and and Bree and Jerem and Joseph. And, you know, it's just, I'm blessed by this amazing group of individuals. And at the end of the day, I track my sort of sense of happiness. And I'm happiest when on those days when I have what I call my Jedi Council meeting. Every once a month, I get together with my team of a dozen Jedis, and we have our council meeting, and they're superheroes. Mm -hmm. Talk one second about your team, how long they've been with you. And then I want, for those listening, I want to talk about how do you hire great people? How do you create a great place to work? What's the strategies there? Well, just real quick, I started coaching one-on-one in 1974. And then in the 80s, I met the key team person in my life, Bab Smith, and we're married and we're co-founders of the company. And Babs runs the company and I run the program. So we have a workshop program, ongoing workshop program for ambitious, talented, successful entrepreneurs who want to grow 10 times and be game changers as they go along. So really, it starts in 1989 when we really started developing a real team. Right now, from just Babs and me, in the 30th year, we have about 135 team members. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, we're in three countries. We have four main centers, L.A., Chicago, Toronto, and London, England. But here's an interesting thing. We have 75 of the 135 who've been with us more than 10 years And we have about 25 who are either just approaching or have passed 20 years. And we're getting better and better. I mean, we've had hundreds who came and departed, you know, some not leaving a trace. (laughs) (laughs) But we've really, I think probably in this 30th year, we really have a handle 
on how to put the word out and how to attract the right people and then how to get them properly focused when they come on board. You know, and I'm not a manager, Peter, and so many of our entrepreneurs are not really managers. Yep. We're I suck. creators of futures. I mean, we go out and we create futures which show up in innovations, increase revenues, profits. So our job is to really, really expand the vision of the company to actually make it more of a really, really impactful organization in the marketplace. So I'm a front stage person. I'm not a backstage person, if I can use a theater analogy. I'm about what goes on on stage and what people pay tickets to come in. But, you know, if you took all the activities that go on stage with what goes on backstage, the activities backstage are incredibly greater and more integral than a lot of the front stage activities. I fully agree with you. I think actually you're going to spend more time with your co-founder and your executives, especially if you're an entrepreneur or startup entrepreneur, than you will with your husband or wife or kids. Mm -hmm. You know, you may easily go put 12 hours a day in six days a week. And while you may be lying beside your spouse, you're sleeping for the part of the 12 hours you're with them. Yeah. Yeah. And so you better love and really enjoy and have great collaborative spirit with your partners. Yeah, and I think the whole point is that you need both worlds and you want to make sure that in the work world, you're doing your best work and it's not wearing you out so that you can also enjoy your personal life. So I see entrepreneurs, it's a 360-degree world. It's not like the corporate world where there's a strict border and separation between one's work life and one's personal life. Entrepreneurs why you're doing your entrepreneurial career, if you want to call it a career, but why you're growing this actually is intimately bound up with who you want to be personally. So in Coach, we've made sure that the entrepreneur is only working on that which the entrepreneur can uniquely do. So our concept in Strategic Coach is fundamentally unique ability. Everybody has unique ability. I have one, Babs has one, and the other 135 people that we have on the team, they all have their own unique ability, which they all know. And then, are you good at unique ability teamwork? Who we're looking for is someone who just wants to focus on their unique ability and really wants to be in a team. That's basically what we're looking for when we think of hiring anyone new to come into the company. So let me share a couple of lessons that I learned in my interviews. I had an interview with a dear friend that was the chief product officer at Amazon, then at Groupon, and then most recently a chief product officer at Uber. You heard me speak about him before, Jeff Holden. He's one of my innovation board members and board of directors at XPRIZE. And when I interviewed him back a couple of years ago when we were first starting our friendship, it was a long, rambling conversation and it honed in on one of his passions, which is hiring people. And so there were a couple of interesting things. So one of the realizations he had was that well, he says very simply, A players hire A players, B players hire C players, mm -hmm. right? So if you're amazing at top of your game, you want amazing people around you. If you're mediocre... You don't want to hire people that are going to outshine you. So what his plan was, he said, inside of Amazon and Uber, they identified their A players and they called them bar raisers. That was the term they gave them. They said, okay, these individuals in the organization are bar raisers. And in any hiring that's being done, there must be a bar raiser in that meeting. And a bar raiser has to be in every single interview and the bar raiser has the ability to veto anyone, and that veto can't be overridden. So it's really trying to create a consistency of quality of great players in the organization. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times you're in an interview conclave, and it's like, eh, the guy's sort of good enough. And good enough times good enough times good enough, you know, ends up down the drain. Mm -hmm. One half times one half times one half becomes diminishing returns yeah. after a while. And rapidly approaches zero. So he also talks about how critical it is to understand the passion of the candidate and make sure there's not a misalignment with the company. And I think that's mm -hmm. very true. Why, you know, ultimately the question of why do you want to work at this company? 
is fundamentally one of the most important questions. And it's unbelievable how many people give a really poor answer to that question. When you're going to hire key people in your organization or Babs is, how do you do it? Well, it starts with who do we need to free up in the existing organization? And the first answer to that is the people who are running the organization. So all hiring starts with what we want to have happen to myself or Babs. In your case, when you come to your next strategic coach workshop, we have a concept called a thousand hood up hours. I love it. Okay. I have a homework assignment. I'm coming next week, pal. Yeah. Well, what our goal for you is, Peter, that you pick the date, but a thousand hours of what you're doing right now over a period that you determine, it could be a year, it could be two years, a thousand of what you're doing right now will be freed up. And when that's freed up, you'll never do it again for the rest of your life. Okay. So it's a permanent shift. I'm sending a message to my who's right now to Esther and Marissa on this. <laughs> Yeah, well, bring them both with you because they're experts on what you're doing now and they're experts on what they know you want to get to. So what I do is I look at that and the key thing here is what you're going to do with the thousand hours. So, you know, I'm kind of biblically inclined and I tell people, you know, the skills that get you out of Egypt aren't the ones that get you into the promised land. <laughs> and I said, it's hard to say how you would free yourself up right now, unless you say, if I was freed up a thousand hours, what would I do? And that starts a cascade effect throughout the organization, Peter. Then who is it that can really free me up in the organization? Or do we have to bring someone in from the outside who will do one of two things, and it's often both, they will free me up, but they'll free up the people who are freeing me up. So the whole essence of actually any hiring, and if you can't logically understand the freeing up process, there's no point in hiring the person. You're just hiring added costs. Yep. So if I was talking to Jeff Bezos, Jeff, if you had a thousand hours, if I was talking to Tony Robbins, I'd say if you had a thousand hours clear and free from what you're doing now, what would you do with a thousand hours that's bigger and better than anything you've ever done? Because that creates the entire motivation that the hiring will be right. Beautiful. So the question of who you're going to hire that enables you to live a more enjoyable, bigger potential life than ever before is critical. So I totally buy that, pal. But when you've identified what you're looking for, mm -hmm. how do you then go about searching for that person and then interviewing that person? Yeah, well, we use two methods. One is affiliation hiring. It's our team knows somebody. You know, it's big now, though, so there's a lot of networks that are in. But we do the normal agency. We have agencies that we go to. And we have a particular thinking process that we call the impact filter. And we describe the hiring as a project. And it has a purpose. It has an importance. It has an ideal outcome. And then there's a best and worst statement. You know, it'll be worst if it looks like this. It'll be best. And then we list eight measuring. These would be actually measurable. It would be an event or it'd be a number that would be reached by this new person that's bigger and better than what we're getting now. So essentially, we're buying the future. We're buying the future in the form of a human being. So we put that out, and then we attract candidates, and then we have another new thinking process that we call the 4 by 4 This has to do with the relationship. So, for example, between podcasts here, my new podcast manager. So I have eight podcast series with eight different partners. Mm -hmm. And over the next year, I'll do 160 podcasts. And Peter, I don't know if you have this experience. I'm really good at creating brand new things, but I'm not very good at keeping them orderly after I've created them. <laughs> I've got some additional skills since you're a 10 and I'm a, a nine. So. so I've created a monstrous mess. And I said, I have to have somebody who comes in and just puts order to this whole thing. But not only puts order to it, actually multiplies the value of all the podcasts that I'm actually doing. And so we put out the impact filter for individuals qualified. They had great things. And one came in and he wowed our team and he had 15 years of radio experience. 
and just really, really wowed the team. And there's four or five levels they go through before they meet me. Yeah. But then I sent out this other form, which is called the 4x4, four four, and you haven't seen that yet. It's four blocks of statements, and the first one is how you have to show up when you're working with me. Okay, you have to be alert, curious, responsive, and resourceful in specific ways geared to the job. Your results have to be faster, easier, cheaper, and bigger, and there's numbers attached to that. And then there's four ways that you can be a hero to me immediately during the first six months, and there's four ways you can always drive me crazy. Uh, I'm uh, going to tell uh, you how you can really drive me crazy. Please avoid these. And if you drive me crazy, by the way, I'm not seeking counseling on this. I'm unapologetic. This drives me crazy. For example, you get tied up with backstage stuff and you forget the front stage impact. You get overwhelmed and you're not responding to the new things that are being created. I said, if you drive me crazy, I will start envisioning a career-ending move for you. (laughs) So I sent this out and Gord Vickman, who's our candidate, he read this about three weeks before he came for the final interview, and he came in with 10 strategies of how he was going to be a hero for me and how he was not going to drive me crazy. Hit the ground running, and I should say, because I'm doing a shout-out, in the first 30 days, he achieved what I was expecting to get achieved in the first six months. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so it's the combination, and then we use various profiling. You're very familiar with the Colby profile, and we also do other profiles where this person likes this kind of work. Not everybody would enjoy working with you, Peter. You would overwhelm them with novelty. And the same thing happens with me. So there's a compatibility. And I would say we're at the 90% pretty good safe bet now with our process. I have a shorter version of your four by four, which I'll share, which when I'm hiring people, I will always bring them in on a trial basis. I feel like I can't possibly evaluate a person until I've actually worked with them. So everybody comes in on a minimum of 60 days, ideally a 90 day trial process where they understand at the end of that Mm -hmm. period of time, I can walk away or you can walk away. Mm -hmm. And during the course of the first period of time, I have a very simple rule. If in a meeting of my team, I want to hear what you have to say, and I sort of say, hey, Greg or Derek, you know, please, what are your thoughts on this? That's a good sign. If you're talking and all I want to say is shut up because I want to hear someone else's thought on this, that's definitely a career ending approach. So it gets very clear where I have people who just on either end of the spectrum, it's like, They've got wisdom, they've got experience, they've got a a new way of thinking about it. I really want to hear their thoughts. And those who I'm just like, please stop talking. It's my truest sense. Yeah. I've never really worked in corporate life, so I don't know what life is like there. But in the entrepreneurial world, things are very, very close. You know, you're working with people closely and they tend to be very, very personal. So the mix has to be right, right from the beginning. It has to be a multiplier for both sides. You know, I'm feeling freed up. I've got an extra whack of energy because I know things that used to bug me on weekends and bug me on free days are not bugging me anymore. So I've been freed up to do what I want to do, but I'm freed up also from worrying about stuff I don't really want to think about. So let me share a few tips and tricks that I've used in my team to help them really be successful and self-managed. Number one, as I said, I do run a competitive process of finding great people. We do ask our team like you do to find candidates for us, and then they go through a process. And I really request 100%. My internal abundance team is 12, 14 people, so it's possible. I'm looking for 100% thumbs up Mm -hmm. on it. I don't want any dissenting votes. Yeah, and I think that's great. The Four Seasons Hotel started that, which started in Toronto, actually. The first Four Seasons was in Toronto. And they have a jury of six people, and they pull them in from management. They pull them in from the work that people is actually doing. They pull in people who are on the desk. They pull in people from front door. They ask them two questions. Is this someone personally you would like to interact with? That's the first question. And the second one is, 
would this person actually represent the highest values of our organization? And they got to have two yeses from all six people for the person to be hired, Yeah, consistent with the culture. And I think that this is really great. We also have a three months. There's a no fault, you know, you're on trial for three months. And we're in three countries, but it operates equally as well in the U.S., Canada, and the U.K., Three months, it's no fault. The other thing that's interesting is I operate my team on a project manager and program manager profit sharing basis. So what that means is when someone enters the company, the teams that are operating Abundance 360 or Abundance Global or Abundance Digital, whatever the case might be, need to take this person and say, I want them as part of my team. And you're effectively going to slice off part of your profit share and give it to that person. So that individual has to help you increase the profit Mm -hmm. greater than the amount that they would take away. People get very crystal about their thinking about, okay, can this person really add value to my life? Yeah, because the existing people are being disadvantaged if it's a bad hire. Yeah. One of the things that I have is that I never use the word cost when it comes to employees. Sure. Or team members. I never use the word cost. I always use the word investment. Then the only question is that a good investment or a bad investment. But I find if you think cost in relationship to team members, they get the message really up front that they're a cost. And they underperform immediately because the attitude is that they're a cost. My feeling is I want them to be an incredible investment. Well, it's interesting. Laszlo Bach, he was the chief people person at Google. He showed an interesting experiment that was done in which they took a 15-minute interview, they videotaped it, then they would show the interview to an outside person, and then they cut the interview down to like five minutes and one minute, and then they cut it down to the person just walking in the door and shaking hands and sitting down. And they asked the person watching the cut down to predict the likelihood that that person would be hired and how well they would do. And it was amazing that we have such processing cues that just the way that person presented themselves and entered the room and shook hands and sat down was so incredibly predictive of a hire and their success. I've heard that we make a total decision about another person within the first two or three seconds. Yeah. Crazy. And we're going, I mean, the human brain does about, I don't know, a trillion decisions per second, but we're pulling our entire experience of human beings up in a matter of seconds. Well, boom, done. You know? Nah. Yeah. And so I remember it was Ariana Huffington. I was talking to her about this and she says, I never do an interview alone. And I always have a planned person to come in after a few minutes and replace me. And if I want more, I'll stick around, but otherwise. So as you're interviewing, being there for the first couple of minutes to get a feel for the person, but not wasting your time, so to speak, is critically important. One of the biggest negatives of my life was my first marriage, which I call my practice marriage. On the day that we got our divorce, I met her and I felt about her exactly the way I felt in the first five minutes when I met her. I didn't like her, but I talked myself out of it. And it was an eight-year lesson of don't talk yourself out of your first impression. Wow. It's so (laughs) critically, yeah, we won't go into the whole process. Can I tell you something interesting? We've hired a lot of millennials who fall within the category of millennial, you know, age-wise. And I've noticed none of the attitudes that I see portrayed, you know, on television, you know, the millennial attitude. And I talked to our team leader, Karen Sklarik, who is really terrific at evaluating, hiring people, bringing them on board. And I said, is there something you're doing that's screening out the negative millennial attitude? And she says, well, I have a question. If you work for us, what do you feel you're entitled to? (laughs) That's great. And she said, if they answer the question, they're gone. (laughs) I love it. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. And she said, the ones who say, I'm not entitled to anything. I'm just looking for an opportunity to grow. Oh, that's good. That's a green light rather than a red light. But it's really, really interesting how canny you get after a while. And it's all based on pain. You know, I mean, 
All the things that turn out to be a pleasure really started with a lot of pain. You know, I'll end my input here is there is a lot of technology coming online right now of using AI and using video for hiring instead of flying people in and disrupting your life and their lives, being able to do initial interviews video wise. And the advantage of that is you can replay a video or you can also have AI analytics giving you emotional cues in a person's face like, you know, they're stressed, they're happy, yeah. you know, I don't want to go as far as to say they're telling the truth or they're not. But there are amazing companies that I'm tracking that are looking at that ability. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about it, there is nothing more important than hiring amazing people into your company. Yeah. And we don't actually spend enough time doing that. Well, the other thing, and we started using this about three years ago, we obviously do references but one thing is that we do social media is who they show up on social media. We had one person who had a hidden social media channel, and we caught it at the last minute, and it was grounds for rejection. Mm. So you're trying to stack the odds towards success here. And there's two things that I haven't quite figured out yet, and I haven't seen any tests that really do it. And one is character. It's hard to test for character. And the other thing is that it's hard to test for ambition. Yes. I think at the end of the day, we're still on such a rich human-to-human -human bandwidth connection that I need to still, even a phone call doesn't do it, even a video doesn't do it. I got to sit with that person oh, yeah. and experience that person and see how they interact. And there's another point, which is a lot of times, I'm not sure I'm a great interviewer, and I depend on my team a lot more. A case in point, when I interviewed Esther, who's my yeah. chief of staff and really one of the most impactful people on my life, she's amazing, a 50 on a 10 scale. I didn't know that when I first met her. Mm -hmm. The team around me said, you need to give her a try. And then it was instantly clear afterwards. Yeah. So you think knowing whether you're a good interviewer or not is an important part of the equation. Yeah. Well, my sense is that people still count, Peter. And there's all sorts of projections that in the future they might not, but I don't know which quarter that's going to happen. So until then, I'm going to maximize our intelligence and our savvy and our wisdom about surrounding ourselves with great people. Absolutely, pal. Well, as always, I love spending my time with you, speaking of great people in my life, and uh, looking forward to seeing you in Toronto. And yes. I think next week is my coach program, so I'll see you soon, buddy. Okay, Peter, thanks. Take care.